it's it's interesting that in this line of work um and i i imagine with with other artists too such as musicians and um, painters but in this line of work there's two sides of what people see and people see the the beautiful side because you're outputting you're outputting the artwork they see the photos they see the videos and they see that's the side they see and what they don't see is the behind the scenes and whether that's sitting in front of a computer spending a lot of time or dragging a bunch of equipment through airport security and trying to argue with the people at the front desk when checking your bags that you can't check this bag in because it's got thousands of dollars worth of lenses and your back is hurting and there's no overhead space to put it in and you just you're fumbling around and it's this completely unglamorous side that goes with the glamorous side and it is an interesting contrast and it's completely worth it it's worth all the time spent on the computer it's worth carrying all the heavy equipment but it's it, it's um people people get to see the good stuff and they don't get to see the bad stuff and it, it is quite entertaining to contrast the two my friends and i have been on a crazy journey for the last couple of years building a company that really was a disguise for building a community. We named ourselves Inertia Network because we wanted to be reminded to never let inertia own us and to break it whenever we have the chance. Our adventures have led us everywhere from swimming with humpbacks in French Polynesia to having a beer with locals in North Korea. And this podcast is our attempt at sharing conversations with people that inspire us, push boundaries, and embody what it means to break inertia. My name is TK and I'm one of the co-founders of Inertia Network. I hope you can join me in learning the philosophies, mindsets, and stories of people that live life on their own terms and ultimately guide you in breaking your inertia. Uh, So today we're joined by Kareem Ilya, an incredible photographer whose work spans everywhere from humpbacks in Tonga to reindeer in Kamchatka. His work has been featured in Nat Geo and he's a good friend of us at Inertia Network. Uh, Thanks for joining us, Kareem. Thank you for having me. So I had a chance to kind of uh, look into your Instagram and, and, and some of the photography that you're you're doing. And I got to say, it's a lot of these pictures are some of the most beautiful pictures that I've, I've seen on Instagram. I think it was an elephant eye. That was a really amazing mm-hmm. photo. Um, but what I kind of wanted to start this conversation on is I wanted to ask you, where did this passion and love of photography start? And Kind of when did you decide that this was the path that you were really going to take? My passion for photography really started with nature and um, looking at the world curiously. When I was a, a kid, I would, if I saw a lizard or I saw a little bug, rather than looking at it and dismissing it, I would get down to its eye level and look at it and try and immerse myself in that world. So I was doing this before I was taking pictures. I would try and look at things from an interesting angle. So I was not very good at art, at the um, mechanical skills such as writing and painting. And when I came across photography, it was a means for me to create art that didn't require me to have great motor skills with my hand to make precise lines and shapes. I could use a camera to capture what I saw. So it for me, photography started with nature and with being curious about the world and looking at things like bugs, lizards, trees, animals, sports, um, people doing things in nature and um, from there, it advanced into more difficult areas to take photos, such as underwater, astrophotography, macro, and other other forms of photography. So then, w- when did you kind of decide that this was the path that you were going to take, I guess, career-wise, and follow follow that passion? As a kid, I never dreamed of being a professional photographer. I did photography because I enjoyed it. I didn't go to school to study photography. I was just doing it for fun. And so there was never this moment, precise moment where I said that I wanted to be a professional photographer. 
it was more that I was continually doing photography and at a certain point the realization it didn't come all at once it was just slowly building that this was a means by which I could live a lifestyle that I wanted to live and that I could be paid to do the thing that I enjoyed doing and so it was a natural progression that when I finished university that I would continue doing photography while I was in university I was being hired to do odd jobs whether it was events or some small product photography or some portraiture photography so I, I realized that I could use this thing that I love doing take pictures to make money and my needs were not very high when I finished university so I wasn't didn't have to make you know I didn't have a mortgage didn't have a family um, I was fortunate that I didn't have loans and so I I just kept doing photography and, and building that. So for yourself, what's kind of the, I guess, do you have an end goal? Do you have like a place that you really want to be? Or do you feel like right now you're in a, you're in a good place for, for kind of where you're at with your photography and your career, I would say? Yeah, I would love to say that I am perfectly satisfied with exactly where I am in my career. I do feel very fortunate to have made some of the achievements that I have, but I definitely have an end goal or at least big goals. The two biggest goals I have are to work for National Geographic and to film for BBC to work on those flagship series like Planet Earth and Blue Planet and to be doing main feature stories in National Geographic magazine. Of course, there are other dreams I have that go beyond that, such as going into space, and photographing from the moon, which is currently unrealistic, but uh, with time, we, we never know what, what technology brings and what commercialized space industry brings. There are other goals as well. I would like to have a gallery. Um, I would like to be able to not have to think through strategically how to go photograph different species because it's either unaffordable or inaccessible. I would like to essentially have the resources to be able to say, I would like to go to Antarctica and photograph icebergs and penguins. Or I think I'll go to photograph polar bears and not have that be a challenge that I have to navigate and come up with the resources, the finances, um, or the means by which to do it. So there are many goals wrapped into one, but the, ultimately I, I will be, I am happy now, but I will be very happy if, and feel like I have succeeded if I can be filming for BBC and photographing for National Geographic. So I kind of, uh, you know, a, a lot of the work that you do is it's very focused on um, like landscape and wildlife. And, um, you know, you just mentioned that you, you, you would love to work for uh, Nat Geo as a photographer or work on BBC as on one of their film projects. So what is it about nature that really entices you, that really draws you in? Even as a young kid, you mentioned it being something that you really took a lot of interest in. And even now, it seems like that's translating into so much of your work. I'm curious to know why um, nature is such a big inspiration to you. Nature is very beautiful and very, very diverse. Just without much effort on our own part, if we go to different ecosystems, they are completely different. The way that light moves around in different aspects of nature, when you think about icebergs how light goes into icebergs and the colors change and animals that live on and around the icebergs um, you've got the way the sun moves across the sky and the weather affects how things look you know you get sunsets and sunrises that are that are red and orange and all different kinds of colors you get storms that come through 
and change the light and create these interesting reflections. Water is a fantastic thing to photograph, whether you're above it or below it, because it, it moves the light and changes the way that you see things. It, it can waves move and, and swirl around and um, create white water. Uh, it's the way that the elements of nature make things beautiful to look at. I think it's it's natural for humans to like, uh, the, to enjoy the beauty of nature. And then you get also these amazing phenomena like volcanoes exploding. And when you when you see lava moving across the landscape, and you feel the power of that. You hear the sound of a volcano exploding and lava flying through the air. Uh, when you when you get in the water with animals like whales and the whales are, are turning and playing, and sometimes fighting and moving past you. And you come across a, a baby humpback whale, for example, and it will come right up to you, look into your eye. And you have this connection with this animal that previously has been almost a mythical animal. We know about whales. People are amazed when they even just see a whale from the surface. So to then have a, a baby whale come up to you with an arm's reach and turn and look at you and you look in its eye and there's this connection and this understanding, that is an incredible feeling. And it makes you feel that this world really is connected and an important and special place to protect and to, to preserve so that other people can experience that and so that these animals can live happily and freely. And I use that, that feeling and I try and capture that and I try and share that with people who may not have the time or the privilege or the ability to go out and see those things. I'm very aware that most people only get to see a fraction of the things that I see. And so if I can capture that in photo and video and I can share it with people and, and bring that to them so that they can experience and appreciate the beauty of this world, then for me, that is, I've succeeded. Yeah, no, I that's I think that's a really valuable thing to try to put out into the world and, and kind of um, get people to experience because I agree a lot of people don't have that opportunity to kind of see you know in the last couple of years I've had a chance to really explore nature and it's such an interesting experience because you feel incredibly small at times but also incredibly at peace at a lot of other times and just there's something about it that it just feels like you should be there and you should be experiencing this and, and kind of moving away from always being in my case, in a city, always surrounded by things that we've built, but kind of realigning. That's a great way nature. to put it, TK. We should do a podcast featuring you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think part of what is amazing about these things is like, I get to have these conversations with people like you who kind of, kind of share their opinion and then I get to kind of think and reflect on the experiences that I've had but something that I do want to talk about kind of about you um, and something that's always interested me in is kind of what it's like to be a creative and the toughest thing about um, pursuing something that is in a lot of ways it's difficult to measure and I think a lot of people who who decide to be creatives um, have there's there's a, there's a difficulty in it um, in in creating things and I want to know what what that might look like for you. Ah, oh, that's a great question. Yes, well, when I am outside or inside wherever I am, but when I'm out in nature particularly, and I'm taking photos and I'm taking videos, I feel completely at peace excited, exhilarated. I don't have to, I'm not thinking about anything else in the world other than being in that moment and trying to make this thing look as beautiful as possible and, and to also experience that at the same time. For me, it's important. I put down my camera in order to use my eyes. And then of course, I think I better get this shot. And so I bring my camera back up. So that part of, of being a creative person or 
I guess the word is creative, as we call them now, is is easy, and that part is fulfilling. Uh, the most difficult part of it is the business side of things, because if you're good at if if you are good at the art form that you've chosen, then it's probably because your brain prioritizes and does better at creative work, which means that there might be something that you're missing in the realm of administrative and business work. Uh, I find it very difficult to get through all of the things that I have to do. There is a, 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 a it's indescribable amount of things that need to be done behind the scenes. And the best way that I like to think about it is imagine if you went to the dentist. So you, you, you needed to go and get your teeth checked up and cleaned. So you called your dentist and your dentist picked up the phone, took the booking. You then went there and your dentist was the receptionist who dealt with your check-in, then took you to the back and did the cleaning, then did the checkout did the billing, did the website, and did all of the other components that is normally done by a team of people. Mm. All at the, and, and to be expected to have all of those skills and to do them successfully, because if you don't, then your entire business suffers. You can be the best photographer, filmmaker, painter, but if you don't have a basic set of skills in all those other areas, it's going to be very difficult. And some things come naturally, right? For me, doing photography comes more naturally. I still work at it in, in many aspects, but it doesn't feel like work. Whereas mm -hmm. I have struggled to develop the skills of organization, of being efficient, sitting in front of a computer, answering emails, prioritizing what is more important to do than you know how to prioritize which tasks will take you farther in your career how do you the route that you decide to take as far as promoting yourself there there are so many options and not all of them will pan out so you have to strategically decide what's the best way to go about it and a lot of that time you spend it alone. I spend many days in front of the computer alone when I'm not out photographing. And that can be difficult as well. So I think your question was, what's the most difficult part about being a creative? And I think it's running your own business and every aspect of your own business mm -hmm. that in it, in it, you're expected to, without being properly qualified, you're expected to do all of these things that in many other industries, professional people would be doing. So then how, how have you kind of overcome that problem? Because I know that you're, you are running um, a business and you are, I feel like you've, you've done a pretty good job in promoting yourself. Um, is it something that you just kind of have had to grind through and push yourself into doing? And then eventually it, it, it became more of like, these tasks, these things that aren't exactly the things that you want to do, but you find you know that they're just necessary to kind of accomplish your your end goal or whatever your goal is at the time. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, honestly, I feel like I am running at five percent capacity in that the amount of opportunities that I have watched go by me because I've been unable to grasp them. I've been too disorganized to to prioritize them and let them slip past me if i had if i had the successful skills uh if i had all of the skills that i would like to properly run a business i would be much more successful than i am mm -hmm. um because it, it's not something that you see from an outside perspective but from an internal perspective, and I, I'm sure this is the same with many creatives, is that they they are not running at full capacity because they just have not yet developed those skills to that would 
utilize their work as much as possible. So my strategies, I mean, I, I try and, uh, I mean, I just try and get through it. I try, I, I've been, I constantly change strategies on what the best way to do it. I've, I've tried to-do lists, hundreds of to-do lists. I've tried uh, making priority lists. Currently, what I do is um, I try and minimize my time on my phone because that's a huge <clears throat> time waster. And I, I have now very recently moved into the idea of using a daily calendar, which I prepared the night before. So mm. that may not be the best way. It may not be a perfect way, but I'm constantly trying new things and adapting and figuring out how I can be more efficient and better at the business side of things. And while I don't work always eight hour days on the computer, because when I can, when the light is good, when there's an opportunity, I will go out and photograph. I'm sometimes checking my email on Christmas or, you know, weekends. There's no such thing as weekends for me. It doesn't matter. I, I get stuff done. Sometimes I feel that a weekend is a relief because I can catch up on things because no one else is working. Mm. Um, that was a very long-winded answer to basically say that I'm not running at full capacity on the business side of things, and I'm continuing to try and get better at it. And it's a slow process. It takes it takes a lot of work, and it's something that I I I don't think I will ever master. My ideal scenario is to actually build my own little team uh, mm -hmm. of people who are good at the administrative work and behind the scenes, getting things done, emails and, and working through um, the business side of things so that I can be out taking more photos, videos and doing projects. Well, I think the mentality of like the mentality of saying, I might never master this, but I will continue to try it and learn and try different approaches is actually a really good mentality to have because it's always seeing it's always pushing yourself into learning and i think that's a mindset that uh when it comes to the everything but like even the ministry stuff it's it's a great mentality to have and i think eventually you'll just see it becoming uh once you figure out the processes that work for you it's going to become easier yeah i realized i've gotten really good at emails um yeah which is something that i never imagined and it, it just occurred to me one day that I am better at emails than most people because there are so many different types of emails that I have to respond to. Um, some that are requests, some that are me reaching out that over time I've, I've looked at what works and what doesn't work and how people mm -hmm. respond. So I've become very good at that, uh, which is an odd skill to have developed for a professional photographer. But uh, it's yeah it is a constant i think that even towards the end of my life i will not be as good at the administrative stuff as somebody who naturally has those skills mm -hmm. and who is well suited for that even at the beginning of their career mm -hmm. well i mean i think as long as you hit the threshold that you're happy with i think you know that's what that's what's most important and I think it, it, it's it's a good thing that you you know what, what you like and what you definitely don't like because a lot of people spend a lot of time like figuring out that like not not having an answer to that. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's interesting that in this line of work, um, and I, I imagine with with other artists too, such as musicians and um, painters, but. In this line of work, there's two sides of what people see, and people see the the beautiful side because you're outputting you're outputting the artwork. Mm -hmm. They see the photos, they see the videos, and they see that's the side they see. And what they don't see is the behind the scenes, and whether that's mm -hmm. sitting in front of a computer, spending a lot of time, or dragging a bunch of equipment through airport security and trying to argue with the people at the front desk when checking your bags that you can't yeah. check this bag in because it's got thousands of dollars worth of lenses 
and your back is hurting and there's no overhead space to put it in and you just you're fumbling around and it's this completely unglamorous side that goes with the glamorous side and it is an interesting contrast and it's completely worth it it's worth all the time spent on the computer it's worth carrying all the heavy equipment but it's it, it's um people people get to see the good stuff and they don't get to see the bad stuff and it, it is quite entertaining to contrast the two i think that's an interesting point you bring up because there's a there's a lot of things that there's an expectation versus reality and the reason why um i think that some work is super, so spectacular and amazing is because that entire process of the the backside that a lot of people don't understand and a lot of people don't get to see they don't um those people will generally wouldn't want put in the work to do those things and so that's what and and that's what puts the people that are creating into a scenario where they produce something that everyone enjoys and everyone thinks is fantastic, but they don't understand what's in the backside because most people don't don't want to grasp those concepts because it's not something that the the difficulty of it is not something that interests them. Yeah, you're you're for example, you're usually out photographing when other people if you're if let's say you you've gone to a national park, you are usually out taking pictures in the middle of the hike when most people are back at their campsite and they're having a beer and cooking dinner and relaxing mm -hmm. and you have waited at the at the peak or at the most beautiful place until sunset and twilight so you can photograph that and now you are walking back in the yeah. dark and by the time you arrive you get back to the campsite and everybody's already sleeping or or getting ready for bed and you still haven't put away your gear and you still haven't eaten any food. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're that one step behind everybody and that you're, you're up early or you're up late. Yeah. So you, you're often out in times that when other people are eating, sleeping, resting, you're out in the cold, you might be hungry and you have a long ways to walk back. And you've done that so that you can capture, photograph, film in the best possible lighting. And that's come down to, I hiked up the Grand Canyon completely in the dark because I wanted to be at the viewpoint when the sun was setting. Mm -hmm. So I think by the time we got back up was 11 at night or 1 in the morning. I don't remember exactly. But that's that's part of it is you're out in the storms and you are yeah. out in the at the times that other people are usually resting. Yeah, and I think when you put yourself in a difficult in the down a difficult path or the path that people aren't willing to follow, uh, then you you all you kind of your end destination is usually something that's pretty amazing or spectacular. So yeah, do you um, would you say that you have anyone in your life? Uh, that whether you know or don't know that you would look to as a, as a role model for the for what you do or someone that just inspires you pushes you create creatively yeah my my biggest inspiration comes from nature mm -hmm. there are other people though many other people that I look at their work and i I see and it's fantastic and i I try and learn from them um, and am inspired by them um so i have a friend who he's been he's been a, a big mentor of mine and helped me out his name is keith ledzinski and he's a photographer for national geographic and he's been very helpful and is constantly pushing me and inspiring me to do more and to to make the most of what i can mm -hmm. um there have been other people along the way. Of course, my family is is very um, supportive. In you know, they'll they'll look at my photography and they'll share it with their friends. Um, there there are other photographers and filmmakers. All of the the people that film 
for the BBC series like Planet Earth and Frozen Planet, Blue Planet, those people are inspirational. David Attenborough as well is, for me, he is a, a, a global hero. And um, yeah, so there there's a number of photographers and filmmakers that I look up, up to their work. Uh, some, some that I work with uh, and pe- people that I have the privilege of working with and they're very talented and, and have completely different ways of, of doing things. Um, one of my best friends is a, an interior architecture photographer. And while I don't have much interest in doing that kind of photography, the skills and difficulty involved in it, I realize it's something that I will never be able to do it to the level that he does it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I may be out photographing icebergs and volcanoes and whales fighting and flying past me, but I look at his work, which is how he moves the lines together and captures these interior and exterior architecture photos. And I realize the humility that I, I, I realize and have is that my brain would never be able to process how to photograph that kind of work to the best of its ability. So while it doesn't inspire me to go and photograph that particular subject, it does constantly remind me that, that there is no way for me to master light and to, to figure out how to do everything. There's areas that I can focus on and that I can share. Um, and there's other areas that will always be these, these things that I, that are un- unattainable or required a completely different skill set that I, I won't have. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, I would look at it as, um, for, for my, my perspective is that I think uh, as a photographer you you're, you kind of have a um, you have a, a niche or or something that draws you in and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're unable to do these other things it just means that you have something that you know that this is what you like and this is the thing that uh, always draws me to want to do more and having respect for the other things is I think is a, is an important thing to have because I think there's so much to learn from different styles and different different just different creators i'm not a photographer myself but and i and i can't speak to the technicality Mm. but i can understand why where i i can kind of put myself in a position where i can see how going from architecture to nature is such a different thing but at the same time how both can be super interesting and and both be very beautiful photography yeah the there's so many different as you said there's so many different styles of photography and for me i hope that i never stick to one style i do i while i don't show a lot of the work that i do i i try and photograph many different subjects genres and in many different styles because that Mm -hmm. continues to to grow your work and teach you how to do things and it actually feeds back over into the work that you do in your own style. And this is something that I would constantly hear. People would advise me and tell me when I was first doing photography, they would say to me, oh, you got to you know, pick one style or one thing, one genre. You can't be doing everything or else, you know, people, it won't work. People want you to have one style. And for me, it sounded like good advice, but I also didn't want to only photograph one subject or mm-hmm. one style. I wanted to photograph many things. I wanted to do underwater. I wanted to do nature. I wanted to photograph people and do commercial work and photograph cities and all these different styles. And I'm glad that I didn't listen to that advice because while it did take longer to get my feet off the ground and mm-hmm. while it may be harder for people to recognize that this is my work because I'm shooting such a variety of topics. What it has meant is that I I live a a life that is much more diverse and allows me to see and experience much more. And I think it's 
it's allowed me and taught me to be able to do many different styles and types of photography, which has become a valuable asset in being able to tell a full story. So kind of interesting that you mentioned, you know, the things that you've learned, I guess, on this journey, because you, you kind of have so many interesting experiences, you know, even just looking at your feed um, or your website and seeing where the places that you get to travel to and go. Uh, I'm kind of curious to know, A, when it, what has been some of the most memorable places that you've been able to go to? And, and kind of B, what lessons have you taken away from all these experiences that you've had to you've been able to um have all right um there's been a lot of memorable places that i've been able to go to during doing photography a few that come into mind in particular uh going to to greenland was was a Hmm. let me let me pick a few before we <laughs> yeah yeah no no worries, no worries. yeah it's, it's i would say i know it's a tough memorable... question yeah the most Be- memorable place i've been to in my travels is planet earth as a whole but mm-hmm. to to pick more specific places s- seeing lava and photographing lava has been such a crazy experience i've i've been able to go to visit a few volcanoes one of those volcanoes was um your typical what you think of as a volcano this kind of cone-shaped thing that explodes every once in a while and would send chunks of lava flying through the air the size of vehicles just way up into the air and then spill down the side of the volcano and you would hear it. it would sound like a bomb this explosion first you would see the the flash of light and you'd see the lava and then and then you'd hear this explosion that would shake you and i was on the neighboring uh mountain or volcano and this thing would explode and the lava would fly and roll down and that was that was a very powerful experience and along the same line of volcanoes I got to fly in a helicopter above a a river of fire on the big island. There's this river of lava, the big island of Hawaii, and to feel the heat from two or 3,000 feet up. I don't remember our altitude, but to feel the heat and the turbulence and the helicopter pilot having to maneuver around clouds of smoke and and the helicopter would shake and he would turn bank the helicopter it had no doors so i was would hanging out the side looking down at a a river of lava and that was that was a crazy experience also seeing um essentially a waterfall of lava going off the side of uh, of a cliff into the ocean and feeling the heat from that and watching as it hit the edge and fanned out um, was was crazy. And um, and that's just that's just lava as a as one category. Another memorable experience is um, swimming with humpback whales and blue whales. And and I spent a couple months a year freediving with humpback whales and taking people on trips to swim with humpback whales and the moments that you get, excuse me, the moments that you get from, from that, when you, when you have whales fighting in front of you and then flying Mm -hmm. past you or seeing dolphins going around and playing with the whales. Um, I, the first time that I saw a blue whale, I got in the water and we dove down and it was a mother and her calf, which was completely unexpected. I'd never even seen a blue whale, and here was a mother and a calf, and they, they, they did a quarter of a barrel roll to look up at us, and wow. then continued along their way. And this idea that the biggest animal that's ever lived is changing its course and turning to look up at you is amazing. Um, I got to free dive with, with orcas as well in, in the Pacific ocean, they were transient orcas that were just happened to be passing. 
Um, and so these these are moments that in the natural world that have been very memorable, but they've also been been trips and moments um, for in terms of culture that have been very interesting. I, I got to go to North Korea a couple times with actually with um, with your team at the Inertia Network. And um, that is a fascinating place because it felt like I was going back in time. And when people talk about Cuba, for example, and they say going back in time, it's it's not the same. Um, going to Cuba after North Korea was was definitely uh, not as impactful. But yeah, going to to North Korea and and seeing this essentially um, from a cultural perspective, this place that has been somewhat isolated in time for a while is a really fascinating thing to observe and photograph and there have been many many other places that i've uh, been able to see and photograph that are that have had a big impact on me sometimes it's simple places just in you know in my backyard or nearby um, that that are also very inspiring and very impactful so sometimes it's just going in the garden and photographing lizards Mm -hmm. and that can be an amazing experience i think it's great that you find uh, you find inspiration and you you find impactful moments from everything because you know a lot of times we kind of wait and we try to do these grand things and i think it's usually smaller moments that really leave something on us well it's both but I think uh, people don't tend to uh, appreciate the smaller things as much, especially when you have such amazing and wild experiences. Like even when you're talking about North Korea and the whales, these are things that I've had a chance to do, fortunately, in the in the past couple of years. The whales, I got to thank. I, I think uh, our team kind of got into that because of you, which I got to thank you for, because swimming with the whales was one of the craziest and uh, most beautiful things that I've ever done in my life. And I'm not a strong swimmer, but it was worth all like the anxiety and the fear before to kind of just get in the water and, and, and experience that. But uh, I think what I what I kind of want to ask you about is because I know that you started um, you, you you're the last couple of years you you have had a lot of focus on the ocean and specifically with humpbacks with dance with whales and taking people into the water to swim with the whales. Um, I'm kind of curious to know how you discovered this and how you decided that this was what some, this was a, a business that you wanted to start and, and something that you wanted to go for. Yeah. Um, you're right. Swimming with whales is, is an amazing experience. I'm, I'm glad to, I'm glad that you got to do that. Um, How did I come across that and starting a business to swim with whales? Well, um, I have, uh, my family is based in Hawaii. Uh, My immediate family all lives here. And so I, I was, after I finished school, I was traveling around the world and I had been doing underwater photography and humpback whales for me was is the pinnacle of underwater photography that's that's what it felt like and so i i decided to come to hawaii to try and to get in the water with whales and to photograph them i quickly realized that that is not an option here in hawaii Mm -hmm. and so i looked to other alternatives and i came across I, i started seeing some photos and video and came across tonga and so i went out to tonga and I joined a whale swimming trip and it was, it was the best experience that I Mm -hmm. could have imagined as far as interacting with wildlife. Um, I mean, you've got this animal that's the size of a bus and you can get in the water and come face to face with them. And when you think about what that means, I mean, translate that to your typical safari, right? Already a safari is an amazing experience, but for the most part, you have to stay in your safari car because if you get out of the safari car, 
you might be eaten by a lion or a leopard or killed by a hippo, trampled by an elephant. So the idea of actually interacting, not just observing, but but interacting and moving with and coming face to face with animals the size of buses. And sometimes while they're fighting is, is a mind blowing idea. And I, I became addicted to that and I couldn't get enough of it. And, and, but after, you know, I had one week with these humpback whales, but it was very expensive. I think I spent five or 6,000 US dollars to, to do that. And I thought this is something that I need to do, but it's not something that I have money to do more than a couple times in life if I was just to spend my own money. And so it took me a couple of years to figure out how can I, how can I do this in a more affordable way? And um, in the meantime, I was sharing photos and people were seeing the work that I made during that one week, National Geographic printed a two page spread of one of the whale photos that I got on that trip. Wow. And so when the time came, I, um, I w- was inspired by a friend who um, I, or I contacted the boat and I acquired a boat with a permit and organized the logistics of housing and food and transport and everything like that. And basically went for it. And I put these, I made a website, put the trips up on the website and all of the people who had been seeing my work uh, and whale photos over the course of the last the three years prior um, people then then came and um, so the whale swimming trips has been two parts for me um, the one part is to the biggest motivation has been to create a means by which I can spend as much time as possible documenting whales um, and uh, to be able to financially do that because the permits, boat rental fees, fuel, and all the logistics is incredibly expensive. So that provides a means for me to do it. What came secondary to that and I didn't realize is the importance of sharing that with other people. Um, to get people in the water with whales, it is a means by which you can take people who have a very limited interaction with the ocean, you show them the whales, they swim and interact with these animals, and it can create an appreciation and an awareness about the ocean that can change their life. To me, I realize it's the fastest way to get somebody to connect with the ocean. It's a very limited privilege that not many people are able to do, but it is an important thing to be able to share that with people because you never know the impact that it can make on someone and the choices that they make in life and the, the control or power that they have to, to do good and to make changes in the planet. So if I can use the whale swimming trips to inspire people to change and make a, make this planet better, take care of it, that would be a great success. Yeah, no, I I 100% agree. I think I have a very similar mentality towards you, especially after having that experience. I remember the first day I went in the water, the very first whale I came in contact with, Matt described it as what I would say, quote unquote, a crazy whale. Mm, And it it would just come, it, it was, it literally came half a meter towards me face to face. And I, I had to, it was just the most mind blowing experience that I've ever had. But also like kind of touching upon what you had said earlier, you kind of realize that this thing is, um, it's a wild animal, but it's so empathetic and it's so caring and it's so conscious of like where it's going. And like, it's a great analogy of the safari because a lion might just eat you, <laughs> but a whale, a whale actually is very playful and very, it actually is almost a, when it wants to be welcoming. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a very intense experience and they are very gentle considering their size and considering that we have spent a good number of years hunting them. Mm-hmm. You know, 
I think there is a group of people, though, uh, that, and I know you touched upon the pros of swimming with the whales, uh, but some people ha- believe that, you know, by getting into the water, and uh, you're disturbing them and interrupting them while they're in their habitat. Um, do you have a take on, on, on this? Do you have a take on, like, why maybe the pros outweigh the cons or if we're actually really being invasive towards their habitat? Uh, yes, they're okay. The way that I like to look at that is that whales are not dumb beasts. They have individual personalities. They have moods. They, they have different whales have different feelings about things. So it would be like asking, let me, let me backtrack for a second. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, there's definitely a way to go about swimming with whales and interacting with them and being in their environment. There's there's ways to do it that are disturbing and invasive, that are quite obvious. You know, if you've got too many boats and you're going straight at them, um, but assuming that it's done well and it's regulated well, then the way that I like to think about it is that whales have very different personalities and different moods there are whales that are interested and there are whales that are uninterested and i like to think of it as imagine yourself on the subway in new york there are people on the subway who would love to have a conversation with you who are interested in interacting with you and there are people who just want to be left alone Now, if you go to those people who don't want to talk to you and you continue get up in their face and you try and converse with them and interact with them, you are harassing them. That is something that they are not interested in. It is not well received and it's not good practice. But there's also people on the subway who are happy to engage in a conversation and will sit next to you and talk and exchange stories. Those are the kind of whales that I like to look for in the water. So when done respectfully and done well, there are times we come across whales and we'll get in the water to check it out and we'll see that those whales are not interested. And we just then move on. And, you know, it may be a a minor temporary disturbance. Um, I try and avoid those to begin with in the initial behavior of approaching and seeing, is this whale interested in the boat? then if it's interested in the boat, is it interested in us in the water? And I, I will move slowly in the water to get us closer in a way that is ideally comfortable for the whale. And when you spend time with the animals, it's quite easy to pick up and tell whether they're interested in you, because if they're not, they leave. And if they are, they'll come over and they'll look at you and swim around you. And, uh, you know, a mother might push its baby up towards you. So in that regard, to make a blanket statement that swimming with whales is not disturbing or that swimming with whales is disturbing is not, it's just, it's not the right way to look at it. Mm -hmm. There are situations that are disturbing and there are situations that are very consensual and appreciated. And you have to be respectful and careful about how you go about those situations and to only create and utilize the situations that are respectful and that are appreciated and accepted by the whales. Yeah, no, I, 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 again, I think it's a very similar mentality that I have with you. I think there's no one way, uh, one way of looking at it because, you know, anytime you include something that's not normally there, you can always, um, you can always see it as invasive, but, you know, I think if you do it respectfully, like you've described and you really pay attention and you really are empathetic to them and their habitat and leave the ones that don't want to be bothered alone. Um, not like you could stop them, but, <laughs> but leave them alone. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good way of getting people into the water. And like you said before, like try to get them to care care about what's going on and and realizing that you're sharing the planet with something that's not just human which i think a lot of people don't really wrap their heads around don't really wrap their head around Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the the positives, I think, do, when done right, definitely outweigh the negatives. Um, of course, you know, there are need to be limits on how many people can do it and mm -hmm. how often. Even the most interactive whales, I will still leave them and take the boat away, you know, so that they have time to be themselves and so that they're not completely surrounded by humans for long periods of times. But it is important, as you said, to get people to to realize that this planet is occupied by more than just other humans. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to uh, move the conversation towards, um, I guess, the lessons that you've kind of learned through your experiences, some things that you fall back to. And, and I guess an extension of that question is, is for people that are kind of starting on this journey, for the people that are leading a life of being creative what what would you what would you say to them what would you what advice would you give those people uh hmm okay <laughs> well i guess two types of lessons the i guess if we break it down into the, the lessons that i've learned in this on a natural world lesson i've I've learned that, as we discussed a minute ago, that you know there are, we share this planet with with other species, other ecosystems, and how valuable it is for us to how important it is for us to value these animals and these ecosystems and to protect them and to realize that we share this planet. That has what been one of the biggest lessons in that regard. Um, let me think for a second about, you're asking the, le the lessons that I've learned that I can pass on to people who are looking to get into yeah, the world I of mean, photography. I, I, I guess mm -hmm. it's like anyone that's a creative or lessons that you've kind of fallen back on that I guess, uh, you think would be valuable to share with people. Yeah. Um, Okay. There's going to be a few things here. Yeah. So lessons that I've learned that I can pass. Well, one of the biggest things I've learned is to to try and acquire as many different skills as you can in different areas that might pertain to your artwork, even if it's a different genre that you have no interest in. You should try and learn those skills, practice those skills, because they will all cross over onto each other. You know, if you're a musician and you're interested in rock music, you should also dabble in the world of classical music and jazz music and different genres, because it will all feed onto each other. And it's the same with photography. If you are interested in wildlife, photograph everything photograph everything in all different lights practice as much as you can because learning everything will help you learn the type of photography or art that you want to learn and this is something that i've learned from both doing and also from neglecting i am not a particularly good video editor and it is a regret that I have that I intend to rectify is that I neglected to do and learn how to video edit because I wasn't interested in it and I didn't want to do it. And so I'm at a place where a lot of the video that I shoot is unutilized because my video editing skills are not up to the task of doing justice to the video footage that I shoot. And I don't have an in-house video editor right now on hand to do those things. So I would say do dabble in many different genres, practice as much as you can, photograph, film, everything, learn skills that are, that may not be of interest to you and may not even pertain to what you do and um, you know, discipline organizational skills discipline learn how to do things that are completely separate from your art form 
and do what you love. If you're not doing what you love, you're not going to put time into it because you have to start with the passion and then you go from from there. If you are just interested in the end result, then you may not be willing to put the work in to get there. Um, if I had spent the amount of time that I have spent on photography in doing a different job set that was not um, a creative art form, or if if I had if I had put the um, the amount of time I've put into photography to do a traditional job like a lawyer, a banker, a doctor, programmer, I would probably be much farther along financially and potentially more successful in that field because uh, how to how to describe this you put a lot more work in than you get out when it comes to what looks like success when you're mm -hmm. an artist you you put a lot of time you put a lot of energy in and so you have to have that passion for it and you have to love doing it and you have to pursue what you love. But when you do that, eventually you will develop the skills that people will pay you to do it. And mm -hmm. I believe that your lifestyle and the rewards of that are, are much greater than the work that you put in at the end. Like the satisfaction and the... Um, I don't know what the word I'm trying to say is uh, the fulfillment that you get mm -hmm. from being able to do your art is, this is a terrible way to end this. Um, <laughs> let me go no. back a second. Can you ask no. the question again? Uh, for the, like for the very first. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so do you want yes. me to just add? Do you, do you want to try do it again? Do you want to like concise your thoughts on that or what's your, what, because sure, I thought it was great. Let's try, let's try that again. I enjoyed your answer, but okay. Um, <laughs> what You may so, have to cut it at a certain point. <laughs> no, I, I think what is interesting is that, you know, these conversations, it's like, you just say what's on your mind and, 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 and what, what comes to your mind. And like, you know, there's no need to have a perfectly polished answer because we're not perfectly polished people. And uh, I think, you know, for even for me, I realize doing this a lot, I have a lot of uh, filler words. I say um a lot, I say like a lot, but you know, you just get, you just kind of get over it because that's just who I am. And I, I, I slowly improve it over time. But um, if I think that answer was good, and I think a lot of the things that you said were really valuable. And I think that being passionate and being disciplined and being organized and 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 i think one of the biggest things is like not just putting yourself into one thing but to experiment with all the things that kind of like surround the thing that you're doing really is a, is good advice because i think a lot of people are thinking like oh if i want to be a director i just gotta i just gotta get a camera and start filming things which is the i think important thing to do but also it's like like you mentioned you should look at video editing. You should look at cinematography. You should look at uh, script writing. You should look at all these things that kind of like encompass everything that comes into the form that you're that you, in the end that you really want to master. So I think your answer yeah. is great, man. Let me just elaborate a little more uh, on that then, and then you can cut and piece whatever you want together. Um, yeah, like you said, contrary to the advice that I got when I first started photography, I would say try and diversify as much as possible learn as many different skills as you can practice as much as you can even in genres and areas that you may not be interested in because it will all feed on itself and it will help you with the work that you want to do and if you spend the time and you put the the passion in then eventually people will pay you to do the thing that you love and what you'll get out of that, the lifestyle that you'll get, and the feeling of fulfillment and satisfaction and reward, while it may not be as financially successful as a more traditional job, it is 
something that will make you feel like you've lived the life worth living. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everything you're, you're saying, man. Even for myself, I think if I had gone down a more traditional route, I, I and I spend all my time, I could have probably been like a doctor. But, you know, at the same time, while that's such a noble, it is, it's, a, it's a noble pursuit. And it's something that I think that it's an amazing thing to, to dedicate your life towards. I've been able to have such rich experiences and been able to like, if I didn't do this, I would never have this conversation with you and learn the things that I am learning in this conversation. Or I probably would never have been able to swim with whales. I wouldn't have been able to go to North Korea or meet some of the most amazing people I've met in my life. And so it's true. I think it's there's a lot of fulfillment when you try the path that uh, it's not exactly easy. It's not exactly the one that it makes sense or the one that can measure. Mm. Yeah, the the rewards you see often don't come for a very long time. You put in, as an artist, you put in a lot of time and work that you're not getting paid to do with the idea that some of it may pan out and a lot of it won't versus a traditional job where you generally directly get paid for the work that you do you as an artist you learn how to work without being paid and then money comes at various times and of course that varies depending on what type of photography or what type of art you do there's commissioned work there's work for hire in the work that i do uh, a lot of it is, is speculative and i don't approach it with the idea of this is going to make me money and this is going to be you know, good work. I approach it with the mentality of this is beautiful and I want to share this with the world. And from that, opportunities come and financial reward um, comes as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I have uh, one last question for you. Um, kind of before we end the podcast, um, we have this saying in, in our team and our company, uh, break your inertia. I don't know if you've heard of this from Matt or before, but it basically means uh, to challenge status quo, move out of autopilot, and, and I guess live more consciously. Uh, so my last question to you is, how have you broken your inertia? Um, how have I broken my inertia? Give me a minute on this. Sure. For me, I think, and for you, we 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 have already been fortunate enough that we have grown up in a generation that was is different than our parents' generation, and I think it was much harder for older generations to to break that status quo and to decide I'm going to pursue this alternative lifestyle and this alternative work. Um, and it's I think it's becoming easier as time goes on. So in that regard, um, while it is has been challenging and still is challenging for people to break out of that, there's a lot more acceptance in society in taking your own path not only is there the acceptance of that, but there's also the ability of that, at least in much of the Western world, this idea that you can pursue a life and make money doing something that does not fit into a traditional lifestyle is relatively new in, in human terms. And so I am very happy that, and, and feel thankful that I, I took that, and went with that. And I, I would say, for me, I try and encourage other people to do that as well, while still having a backup plan. I did have a backup plan. I studied other things when I went to school. But um, how do I try and shake things up and do things different? Um, I mean, I try and spend as much time as I can photographing natural phenomena and things that people aren't used to seeing and then showing that to 
to them, showing that to the world to say, look, there is more outside of our regular lives, working, living in a city, socializing. We are part of this natural world and this world around us does exist. And it's important to recognize it, to appreciate it and to do something about it, to protect it and to make sure that this planet does stay as it is as it is and as it was in some areas that it's important that all of these ecosystems animals plants are important to the identity of our planet and that we need to make the effort to change our habits and realize that we are not living alone one of one of the the things that i try and that I have come to understand and and to try and push people to understand is that the idea of environmentalism and taking care of this planet is not a political idea. It's not a religious idea that people should have varying opinions. I mean, when you think of this planet as your home, and then you think of your own home that you live in, you don't shit in your own house on the floor, yeah. right? Yeah. You you take care of your house. You clean your house. You tidy your house. You put things into your house that are nice. And you try and keep it in good order because it's your home. So, And if somebody tried to come into your house and exploit and use all of your resources and uh-huh. use all the water and use all the electricity and to leave trash on the floor you wouldn't be very happy with that and you would make an effort to stop them from doing that and and to clean it up and i think that's an important mentality that we have to take with our whole planet is this is our home so let's not trash it yeah man i uh i think it's a great message to end off on and i think it's really important that people have a little bit more uh are a little more conscious towards that because I think we, a lot of us don't really think about it, but I think we're also in a, in a generation and the next generation growing to really have that in mind and, and, and starting to make the changes. And so I think I like to try to be optimistic about it. And I think a lot of people, and I think people like yourself are pushing that narrative and it's, 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 it's a great thing. So uh, before, before we close it off and end it off, do you have anything you want to plug or share anything that interesting you have going on? I know the situation is a little bit weird right now, but um, anything that you want to share that you're doing? Yeah. Um, well, currently we're in the middle of a pandemic. So it is, it is an interesting time to, see the world and to reflect on things i have often i often spend time anyway working from home at alone so in that regard it has not been as big of a drastic change for me as i have seen it for for friends and colleagues but i'm using this time to while the world is mostly on pause to try and catch up with the things that i feel um, that I've been behind on. Um, so I've been working on various projects, both personal and work-wise, um, planning to to create a reel, a video reel to show my work, outreaching. Um, I've been reading Marie Kondo's book, so I'm planning to mm-hmm. overhaul my belongings and tidy up my life. Uh, as well as working on little projects and trying to figure out how to to utilize and go to the places that I want to go um, to photograph. I've been, for a long time, I've been dreaming about going to Antarctica mm-hmm. and going up to Svalbard or Canada to see polar bears. I have never seen a polar bear, and that is something that I would like to do and photograph. And so in this time, I'm, I'm trying to utilize this time to figure out how to position myself for the coming years. How can I go photograph snow leopards, polar bears, penguins, um, icebergs in Antarctica, other whale species? How can I basically maximize and 
do the most that I can with the opportunities that have been given to me. So th that those are, I don't have a particular project that I'm working on. It's more a restructuring and reorganizing. Mm. And in the meantime, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still hopeful that we can run whale swimming trips at the end of the year, though mm -hmm. that may not happen. Um, but otherwise, you know, I've, I'm working on, on photography aspect. I'm working on my business, um, working on video editing projects and drone flying drone which is something that we we haven't talked about but is a big part of the work that i do is using drones to photograph the world and film the world from a different perspective so yeah just i've been moving along and trying to use this opportunity to catch up and get my life in order so that i can maximize the opportunity and to continue to photograph and do these things in the world that have been such a pleasure to do up until this point. Well, uh, I mean, I'm sure we're going to have another one of these soon, another podcast. And I, I would love to talk a little bit more about the drones because I think your drone stuff is pretty incredible. Uh, I really love the, your, um, your, your, is it the Pachamama reel? I thought uh, that was, yeah. I thought that that one, first of all, I got to say you have some dope music choice. I love it. That's like one of my favorite songs, that Odessa song. But second, um, yeah, no, it's 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 amazing the things that you can kind of like do with a drone. Um, yeah, and I uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of like jump on here with me and, and and have this conversation with me. It's always such this is a this for me is what's fulfilling is that being able to have these type of conversations. And uh, I'm sure that there's going to be definitely products we're going to see each other on in the future. Yeah. That would be good. Thank you for uh, having me on here and talking with me. And um, yeah, it's been good. All right, man. Uh... Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Inertia Network podcast. If you like what you heard, come check out our website, inertianetwork.com, or follow us on Instagram at Inertia Network so you can see what our journey has looked like. Hope we can continue on this adventure together, have some meaningful conversations, and break our inertia. See you next week.